Hi, my name's Andy, and this is a talk uh, about how to do test-driven development in Ant. It follows on from uh, what we learned in a previous video, um, which is about how to do some basic uh, code reuse in Ant called Everybody Hates Build.xml. Uh, by the end of this video, you ought to be you ought to know enough about uh, how to write tests for your Ant code that you no longer fear your Ant code. Uh, in fact, uh, you enjoy working in Build.xml. Um, because you know that it works because you've got tests for it. Um, there is a blog post that goes along with this video. Uh, check the show notes, there's a link to it. So everything I say in here is repeated in there in written form might be helpful. Okay, so what am I going to talk about first? Uh, uh, what exactly do we want to test when we're testing um, our ant code? Uh, then we're going to look at how I'm laying out my code. Uh, go through a couple of examples, one fairly straightforward. Uh, one a bit harder. Then I'm going to talk about um, the way you can make Ant do anything you like, which is uh, which I'm calling the nuclear option. Uh, then I'm going to have a bit of a brief look at some of the uh, um, the harder bits of testing Ant files. So the first two examples are about how to test that Ant did what you expected it to do actually on the disk. And then later on we're going to talk about how we can write more unit test type stuff, which is going to run a lot faster and be a lot more principled and a bit harder to do. Okay, so let's start off by just thinking about what exactly do we want to test. Well, when we're right, we're testing ant files, um, obviously our ant files are building some code, probably some Java code, but I'm not talking about testing that Java code. Uh, hopefully uh, you know how to do that in whatever language. If you're using JUnit to write your unit tests, uh, you can run those tests uh, using a JUnit tag uh, in your ant file. Uh, and it's fairly straightforward, and we're doing what a lot of people, other people are doing. I want to talk about what it seems to me not many people are doing, which is testing that your build file is really right. Um, so there's two parts to that, really. One is build, testing the build artifacts, as in the stuff that got made when you ran your build file, uh, like jar files, zip files, stuff got copied, uh, all that kind of thing. Whatever it is that your build does. Um, maybe some kind of deployment somewhere, or I don't know. Um, and the other part is testing that the actual logic within your build file is correct. So, for example, that your build fails when something in particular goes wrong, and that it succeeds when uh, all is well. Uh, that the dependency uh, chains that you've set up uh, are correct. Uh, and uh, that your, uh, your particular bits of code, your units, uh, for example, a macro or a target, uh, are correct. Um, uh, uh, and in particular, that might mean writing something that you would call a unit test, which means something which doesn't touch the file system or anything else, just checks your logic. Okay, so how am I setting up my code? Well, I've got a file called build.xml, which is my normal build file that you might have if you have a um, some code that's built by Ant. I've got another file called assert.xml, which contains some support code and uh, uh, stuff that we need to write tests, um, which potentially could be reusable in lots of different projects. Um, and mostly what it contains is uh, assertion targets or macros, um, <coughs> which is why it's called asserts.xml. And then the tests for this particular build.xml are in a file called test-build.xml, and that's where we write tests um, that use the assertions to make assertions about what our build does. So to run them, uh, we call ant, and we use the minus f command to say, I want to run the test-build.xml file, and give the name of the test we want to run. I have actually written some magic that runs all the tests in the test-build.xml, but I won't go into that uh, in this video. Uh, just one thing too many. Uh, uses the nuclear option if you're interested. Okay, um, so what we do then is inside test build, uh, we use an includes tag to include the asserts.xml file so that we have those assertions available to us inside test build. Okay, so uh, let's start with a very simple example. What we want to do is we've got a build which compiles some code using Javac. Uh, so uses a Java compiler to compile some code. We want to write a test that check uh, that checks that this um, Java actually does what we think it does, um, which is that it compiles the code. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to check that a .class file gets created when we run our build. 
So here's the test. Um, inside test build.xml we have a target called test class file created. Um, and inside it's just one assertion. You haven't seen this assertion yet, I'll show you that in a minute. But there's, it's an assertion that we've written called assert target creates file. And it takes two um, uh, arguments. One is the target. So the target in this case is just called build, which is normally the default target in an ant build. Um, anyway, the point is, it, you can say which target you want to run, and you can say which file you're expecting to be created by running this target. So to run this test, we say ant-f test build XML, and then we give the name of this target, which is test class file created. So when we run it, what it actually does is it uses this assertion, assert target creates file. This is something we created inside asserts.xml, and this is a macro def. And if you don't know what a macro def is, uh, watch the previous video, which is called Everybody Hates uh, Build.xml. Um, it explains a little bit about macros. Not a lot, actually, but anyway, you get the idea, hopefully. Um, so this, as we saw, um, there are two attributes you can supply to this task. Assert target creates file. One attribute called target, one attribute called file. So the target is the target that you want to run. And file is the file that we want to check exists. So then inside the sequential part is where we have the actual code that runs when you run this task. Um, what it does is it deletes the file we're hoping to find. It says quiet equals true because it doesn't mind if it doesn't exist. Then it runs the target we've asked to run using a sub ant command. So sub ant runs ant on build.xml. So the ant file it's using is build.xml. <laughs> Um, and the target that it's running is this target that we passed in as an attribute to this macro def. Um, and then all we do then is we make, we make another assertion, which is using an assertion we'll see in a minute. This assertion is called assert file exists. And the file uh, that it's asserting exists is the file that we want to ask you to check. So this macro uh, deletes the file, runs the target, and then checks the file exists. So it effectively checks that um, the file got created by running this target. Okay, so the last thing that's missing here is um, this assert file exists macro, which is also in asserts.xml. It takes one attribute called file. Uh, it, it, it Inside the sequential part, which is where the code lives, it, it has an echo, which just says checking the existence of the file. And then what it has is a fail uh, task, but only under certain conditions. So what it says is fail with the message file does not exist under the particular condition which is that the file with the, with the file name we want is not available. So we use the available uh, task and then we wrap it in not to say do the opposite. So if the file is not available, i.e. it does not exist, we fail with this message, otherwise we do nothing. Um, and the assertion succeeds. Okay, so that was a simple example checking that the, a piece of code got compiled. Now let's look at a more difficult example, really quite complicated in terms of implementation, simple in terms of concept. Um, I imagine that our build creates a jar file, and we want to check uh, that it creates a jar file with the right stuff in it. Uh, and in the, the example we use, we're going to check that the manifest file has the right main class in it. But you could be checking anything, you know, any file exists inside that jar file with a particular, uh, particular contents. So we're going to create a test called test jar created with manifest. Um, what we're going to do is two assertions. We're going to, first of all, we're going to do assert target creates file, and we've seen that one already. That will run the target called build. It will check that this file exists, which is called myproduct.jar. So it will do both those things. It will run the target and check that the target created that file. Um, and then we're going to run another assertion after that, which is this new one you haven't seen before, called assert file in jar contains. And uh, the, the jar file that it's uh, looking in uh, is called is myproduct.jar, the same jar file we checked was created. And, and then the file name within the jar that we're looking for is manifest.mf. And the text that we want to find inside that file is this main class blah 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 business. So you can see this could be quite useful. Quite often we build a jar and uh, uh, we screw something up um, and th there's no main class, so the jar is no longer executable. So we want to check that, um, make sure we find out about it immediately, it goes wrong. Okay, so first of all we need an assertion called assert file in jar contains, because that's the one we called on the previous page. 
Uh, this takes in three attributes, the name of the jar file, the file name to look for in that jar file, uh, and the text to find. And then we've got a sequential uh, section here. I've skipped a little bit of code that I hope you can work out um, based on what um, based on the rest of the stuff in this video. Basically, we check that the jar file really does exist, and if not, we fail. And we check that the jar file contains the file um, that we're looking for, and if not, we fail. Uh, then we uh, we delete a temporary directory, and we unzip the jar file into a temporary directory. I looked for a way to do it without creating a temporary directory. Uh, the way that I tried uh, using a zip file set didn't work. So anyway, for the moment, this is the best way I know. Unzip your jar file into a temporary directory, and then right at the end we delete that temporary directory again. And in between, there's some magic, which is on the next slide. So, once you've taken in this slide, let's move on to the next one and see the real magic. So the real magic is going to look in that unzip directory for the file with the file name uh, we said, uh, containing the text that we we're looking for. So, here's the magic. It's a fail, just like the last one we looked at. So it's fail with a message saying this jar file with this, uh, with this file should contain this text. And the condition under which it fails is that the resource count doesn't work out the way we expect. That the, that the resource count works out, uh, with the zero. So let's start with the resource count line. So resource count when equal, count equals zero. So what they're saying is fail under the condition that this resource count uh, comes up with an answer of zero, i.e. we couldn't find anything. So what's the definition of the resource count? Well, it's a file set looking in the directory, this temporary directory where we unzipped um, our jar file, and um, any the, the files that match, the files that are part of this file set, are those which have the file name we've supplied and contain the text we're looking for. So this is an AND block, uh, and there's two things in there that we, we want to be both true for a file to count. So if the file has the right file name, so star star slash, and then the file name, so the file name could be anywhere, any path, um, but its name has to be the file name we asked for, uh, and it contains the text that we're looking for, then it, the, this file is in the file set, so the file set looks through that unzip directory to find everything that matches that AND condition. So any files with the right name that contain the right stuff, uh, uh, that bundles that up into a file set. And then what we do is we do a resource count on the file set, basically counting how many things are in the file set. If there are zero things in the file set, that means we didn't find a file with the right file name containing the right stuff. Uh, so our count is zero, so the condition is true, so we fail. Okay, make sense? This is the kind of magic you have to do um, in Ant uh, to do logic like this. Uh, it, to me, it doesn't feel like Ant really wants to let us do this stuff. It seems too hard. Anyway, it can be done in this case. But there are other cases where it can't be done, or at least I can't work out how to do it. So, since Ant 1.8 um, and Java 1.6, there is a nuclear option. Uh, Ant has this uh, task called script, and inside script you can do anything you like um, in your language of choice. Now, the only language that I actually found myself able to choose uh, was JavaScript. I checked um, the Sun virtual machine, the IBM virtual machine, uh, and the OpenJDK, which is essentially, sorry, I shouldn't call it the Sun, the, the Oracle virtual machine, uh, OpenJDK, which is essentially the Oracle virtual machine as well. Um, in all three of them, the only language that was available to use in this way was JavaScript, because the Rhino JavaScript virtual machine, which was originally written by Mozilla, is now included in Java since 1.6. Um, so all this all this waffling basically means you can have a script tag. Uh, the only language that I found I could rely on was to say script language equals JavaScript. Then you put that C data um, pling there to mean that you can put anything inside. Um, and then you can write any JavaScript you like, including JavaScript that uh, you calls the Ant Java API, uh, which means that you can do almost anything you would want to do um, from inside one of these script tags. Um, it's going to be hard for people reading it to understand your JavaScript, because it's not the Ant that they were reading in the rest of the file, and you're going to get bad error messages when things go wrong. I haven't found a good way around that. 
but anyway, given that nuclear option, we can do all kinds of things. Uh, so remember, the other types of testing we wanted to do, other than testing the actual artifacts produced by the build, was checking that the logic uh, of our build is correct. So we want to check that um, a, a, give, a certain target will succeed or fail um, under a particular set of conditions. We want to check that some dependencies, especially the, the indirect dependencies that we were hoping would um, fall out from the direct dependencies we've defined, uh, do indeed fall out. Uh, and we also might want to check just that a piece of logic does uh, what we expect. You've seen that we you can write quite complicated logic as we have done even today. Um, it's not at all straightforward to uh, be sure your logic's correct. We might want to write a unit test that just checks it. Okay, well success and failure we can do, uh, although I've only found a way to do it using the nuclear option. So I've written uh, a macro here, a task here called expect failure, and it takes the attribute uh, as it, it, the attribute it takes is the name of the target, and basically it runs this target inside whatever project you're already in, um, and it fails if the target doesn't fail, right? So it's expecting failure, so if the target fails, um, it does nothing, and if the target doesn't fail, it fails. Um, <clears throat> it's just moving me out of the way. So... The way it works is it's, it has a normal sequential tag, um, just like we're used to, uh, and it, it says it declares that the property x.court is local, just so that we don't pollute the namespace with that property, and then it falls into a script tag, a uh, little bit JavaScript. It's just a try catch. Inside the try, we execute the target with the name target. Um, so that's how you execute a target in using the, the ant API. Project is just a global variable that's available to you. And if an exception got caught, we set a property called x.caught, which is the one we declared to be local above. Um, we set it to any value, I've set it to yes here. Um, uh, if an exception didn't get caught, then we don't set that property. And then we fail unless the exception got caught. So that last fail thing there, instead of putting a condition inside, you can just use unless or if attributes in the fail uh, task itself. So what I've said is um, fail with that message saying the target succeeded and the real message would say something like when we expected it not to succeed um, but I didn't have room for that. So we fail with that message unless an exception got caught meaning that the target failed. Make sense? Okay. Uh, testing dependencies. Well in order to test dependencies what we really want to be able to do is run ant Run Ant's dependency resolution mechanism, um, but don't actually do anything. Don't make any JAR files or compile any code. Um, as far as I can find out, Ant just doesn't support this functionality, which seems really surprising. Uh, luckily for us, we do have uh, the nuclear option, and we can do it like this. So this is, I was quite pleased with this bit of JavaScript. Basically, let's make a target called uh, print C depth, which prints out the dependencies of um, the target called C. Um, so imagine now we've got a target that's just called C. We want to know the dependencies. Actually, it's not called. It's called target C. Sorry. Um, we want to know the dependencies of that target. What we do is we drop into a script tag. We get this variable called targs, which is the um, list of all the targets in the project, and we loop through all those targets in the project, uh, which is what that while loop's doing. Um, <clears throat> and then we put the particular target we're looking at now into this variable called targ, and we set the unless property of that target to dry.run. So every target in Ant can have an unless property, which means don't run it if this property is defined. Uh, so the property that we're saying you shouldn't run it uh, if it's defined is this property called dry.run. Okay, so what we've done is loop through all the targets and said, um, don't run these, this target if the dry.run property is defined. Then immediately below that we do a project.set property and we do define that property. So now none of the targets should run because they've all got unless set on them for, for a property which is defined. And then we just execute target C. And what Ant does if it hits this unless clause is it still prints out I'm running this target but it doesn't actually run it. Um, which is slightly weird, but it's quite useful for our purposes. So the other thing we need to do is we need to be able to run Ant and capture that output. 
and then make assertions um, about what's in the output. Um, well, that's the way I've found to um, uh, check these dependencies. So what we do is we start off by deleting a file called cdeps.txt. Then we run ant and we run this target that you just saw, which prints out all the dependencies of C. So ant runs another instance of ant, and it has this option output, which uh, will write the output out to this file called cdeps.txt. So the ant task runs another lot of ant. Uh, runs the target that we defined, which prints out the dependencies of C without actually running C, um, and it writes its output out to cdeps.txt. Note that it also prints out the output. If that's a problem, I don't know how to resolve it. It was fine for me. Um, and then we fail under a particular condition. So we now have got the dependencies of C in a text file, and we will fail uh, under some particular conditions, saying target A did not execute when we ran C. So this is a test I forgot to give you the name of the test. The test is test that C depends on A. So basically we're running C, catching, capturing all of that dependency information, and then we're looking inside the dependency information to check that A got run. So what we do is we have an, a fail just like before with a condition and a resource count just like we had before. And the resource count uh, contains a file set which is only looking at one file. So the resource counts are either going to be zero or one. It looks at this one file called cdeps.txt, and if that file contains the text target A colon, that means that target A did indeed run when we ran C. So, uh, if that file contains the text target A, then the resource count will be 1, and we will not fail because the resource count wasn't 0. If, there's, if that cdeps.txt doesn't contain the words target A colon, then the resource count will be 0, which means the condition is true, which means we fail. So, in summary, we uh, run the target which prints out the dependencies of C and if that file which is the output of running that target contains the word target A we know that target A is indeed a dependency of target C and we, we're we fine and we just go on to delete that temporary file at the end um, but if that file doesn't contain target A something went wrong uh, A doesn't depend on I mean, C doesn't depend on A and we fail Make sense? Straightforward, isn't it? Okay, so, um, uh, other things we might want to do, and this is quite, this is purely theoretical now because, um, I haven't done this because there's quite a lot of donkey work to do, um, and I actually think the most valuable thing is the first thing we talked about, the testing artifacts, but I wanted to look into, can you test units of ant code in a unit test style that genuinely doesn't touch the file system, uh, and will execute quickly? So in order to do that, we'll need fake versions of all the normal tasks that we use. For example, Java copy and Java and uh, all the other things that you, you use in your build. So anything that actually does something to a file system, we're going to have to write a fake version of it. And that fake should probably just track what happened um, in, a, in a dumb way or something like that um, and not really touch the file system. And then what we can do is make assertions that check what that tracking information says and check that our logic does end up with the particular task we're expecting executing under each set of conditions. So how this will work in practice, we make a um, XML file called something like fake tasks.xml and inside there we've got loads of macro defs with names which match the built-in targets uh, tasks in Ant. So th this is an example of the jar task. In this case it has an attribute called dest file. What I've done here is I've left out all the optional attributes of jar and to do this properly you would need loads and loads of optional attributes, which is all the other uh, attributes you can pass to the real JAR task. And then uh, a really simplified version of what we would need to do, we need to set a property. Um, and what we're doing here is setting a property saying JAR got run, um, not even tracking what the dest file was. So in real life, we'd need to track what the dest file was, and we'd need to keep a log of every time JAR got run or something like that. Um, anyway, once we have this set up, then what this means uh, is that if we depend on uh, some undocumented behavior of the version of ant that I've used, then this can be used to fake out um, uh, all the tasks in ant. And we can write our targets so they look absolutely normal, and they call the jar um, task, just like we've got here inside target A. And what we do is we do an include at the top of build.xml, that includes fake tasks.xml, and when we don't want the fakes to be used, we just delete that file. And because we said optional equals true, 
that include won't complain, everything will work as normal. When fake task.xml does exist, Ant will complain very loudly, and it will say we are attempting to override um, a, bill, uh, a known task, which is jar, uh, with our own fake version, and it will say that for all the other things we define if we define them. Um, what's surprising to me is it complains in a way that suggests um, that it hasn't worked, but uh, when I try it, it actually has worked. So our fake, my fake actually does get used, even though Ant implies it shouldn't be. So what I'm saying here is this, is a, this comes with a huge health warning, which is that um, this is, seems to be undocumented behavior in the particular version of Ant I'm using, and there's no guarantee whatsoever that your version or future versions will do this. But you can override all those um, tasks in my version of Ant with those fakes. Um, uh, and that means... The advantage of that is that means you can write your build.xml with only that one line at the top different and everything else um, pretty much written as you would normally write it. Um, if you don't want to rely on undocumented behavior of Ant, um, if you don't want to rely on the undocumented behavior of Ant, you can do this a more awkward way, which is you could define uh, fake and real tasks called do jar or something like that. So there'd be a fake version of do jar which just tracks information. Um, uh, like the fake we saw, and there would be another version of DoJar which just hands on control to the real jar. And then all you would do is you'd have an include at the top of build.xml, which either includes the fake versions or the real versions of all your tasks. What that means is that your build.xml can't use jar or copy, you have to use DoJar and do copy these things that you defined yourself um, as either fake or real, which would be pretty awkward. Um, but if you did that from the beginning of your project and everyone was happy to do it, that could definitely work. And that would uh, be much more likely to work in future versions of Ant because it doesn't rely on some undocumented behavior. Okay. Given all that, this is how we do it. So in uh, test build, we what we do is we include build.xml as a dependency. And then we have a target in there called test a runs jar. And it depends on target A in build. So that means when you run that test, first of all, it runs um, target A. And then it fails, saying the jar didn't run, unless that property which we set, jar was run, did indeed get set. So our fake will set that property if uh, build.xml does make a jar as it's supposed to do. But if we remove that line from build.xml, this will fail because it doesn't call jar. So our fake jar doesn't set the property. So the failure message triggers. The way you run it is you have your fake tasks in some file called real fake tasks or something like that. Uh, and to run the test, you copy that into um, fake tasks.xml. Then you run your test build.xml. And then afterwards, you've got to remember to remove your fake tasks. Otherwise, your real build is going to use the fake tasks and everything is going to go wrong. As I say, huge health warning, but it works for me. And that is how maybe you could write unit style tests for Ant. But as I say, I haven't really done this. I've just been trying to work out the best way. So in conclusion, um, it is possible to do test driven development in Ant. Um, you can check things like dependencies um, using the hacks that I've shown you. You could check the units, um, but you're really kind of fighting against uh, the system. And uh, maybe if you care that much, you should just be using Gradle or Gantt or um, Make or something else that makes this easier. I don't know whether Make makes it easier. I'm sure someone will leave a comment telling me. Um, uh, but in terms of having confidence that your build really does something, you know, the number of times I've had a build where it was supposed to build a jar file, um, but actually it doesn't do anything at all um, because some property got messed up or you know, there were no dot java files to compile or you know, whatever um, <clears throat> or your unit test report um, can't find a directory so everything falls over or you know something like that um, if you have tests that test the really important things about your build like we ended up with a jar file that jar file has some code in it that jar file has a manifest um, and then if you're running all kinds of other you know if you're running some other script from within your own file um, for example, we're running a dojo build. Well, we want to check that the dojo build actually built some code into it and it's not empty. Um, uh, once you've got, once you've wrapped tests around your ant file that check that the stuff that comes out of your ant file um, really contains the stuff you thought it contains, you can start refactoring your ant file and all kinds of exciting things because you're not quite so scared 
um, that any touch you make of any part of the fire is going to kind of bring it all crashing down and you won't find out about it until three weeks later when you ship a hot site to a customer that's got no code in it or something like that. So um, I highly recommend um, test-driven ant. Um, and that's it.